Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Mel and today we're going to be doing some of my recent reads. I've been doing a lot of vlogs recently and I really enjoy my time vlogging but not every book makes it into a vlog. I also really don't like filming wrap-ups and wrap-ups honestly just they don't seem to do as well so if you guys love them and you want them let me know down in the comments below and I might bring them back but for now I really am enjoying doing vlogs but I don't necessarily feel like I need to talk about every book over and over and over again so I'm gonna try out some recent reads so about every two to three months when I have enough books I will be doing a recent reads to kind of go over with you guys what I've read that was not in vlogs and what I haven't already given you my thoughts on with that being said let's jump into the like 10 or 11 books that I have read over the last two months that I have not yet gotten a chance to talk to you guys about. The first one is, is going to be the back Backless Book Club pick for the month of January, I think. And that is An Echo of Things to Come by James Islington. This is the second book in the Lycanius trilogy. We've already had a live show. It's on my channel. I will link it up here so you guys can check it out. This is an epic fantasy series following a young boy who is not as powerful as he feels like he is supposed to be. And he gets a visit from a mysterious stranger that tells him that he has to go to a faraway land to save the world, essentially. It's a pretty basic fantasy plot. A lot of people love this, this series because it warps and plays with time and it is an epic fantasy but unfortunately it's just not working for me. I'm gonna lump in the light of all that falls as well because I have read both of them but we have not yet had the live show for the third one yet. I just don't love this series. The prose does not work for me. It is very tell not show. It is very just kind of outlined but not giving you those little moments in between. The characters just don't feel very fleshed out to me. The plot is very convoluted and the ending that I've heard was so great and amazing felt very, very flat to me. I felt like I saw everything coming and nothing shocked me or wowed me. It didn't really tie up in this nice perfect bow that everybody was telling me about. I just, I don't love this series and I think that that is well known and I'm going to quit harping on it. Both of these books ended up getting, I think, a two and a half star. So not absolutely terrible. I didn't hate my time, but I didn't love it either. Um, next up, I read Ninth House in preparation for reading Hellbent. Ninth House, I felt pretty similar on my reread as I did the first time. I liked the murder mystery plot. I didn't just solely connect with Alex. And then I read Hellbent. So Ninth House is following Alex, who is becoming a part of the Ninth House of Yale, which is part of like the spirit occult world and she can see ghosts. Then a girl gets murdered. There's a murder mystery plot as well as a plot to try to figure out what happened to her mentor Darlington. Helmet picks up exactly where Ninth House leaves off but it is very very different in tone to Ninth House. I found that Ninth House was a lot more slower moving, a lot more focused on the murder mystery aspect of things, whereas Hellbent just kind of hits the ground running and doesn't really give the characters time to breathe. There are more characters in Hellbent and more relationships that I enjoyed, but I didn't feel like we stopped long enough to give those characters those little moments to really make me feel and connect and understand their motivations and their relationships. I also felt like this book was a little bit too breakneck because things just kept happening but nothing really felt like it was moving the plot forward, if that makes sense. We were having all of these moments, but I kept waiting on them to really have an impact on the story. And for most of it, you could have left a lot of that out and it still would have been fine. I found that the first half of this book was a lot more, I don't wanna say slow in pacing because a lot happens, but slower in pacing than the end. And I don't know, I liked it okay, but I felt like Lee Bardugo was trying to shove way too much into one book. We went off the ghost train and onto the demon train and there was just too much going on with not enough time spent on any particular thing for me to completely love it. I forgot to mention what rating I gave Hellbent. I gave Hellbent a 6.33 or a three star. Then we have A Shade of Madness by Chiago Abdallah. This is the sequel to A Touch of Light in the second book in the Ashes of Avarian series, I believe is how you say that. And I really, really enjoy this series. It is an epic fantasy that is following multiple characters and their respective roles in the war that is going on. There is a madness, which is kind of like a zombie type plague thing. And I don't really wanna say too, too much more than that because the story does unfold in a really cool way. Touch of Light I found to be a little hard for me to get into. I don't know if that was the time in which I read it because I wasn't really in a reading mood and I was feeling pretty slumpy when I read A Touch of Light or if it is 
just that the story drops you in and expects you to just kind of figure it out, which is fine. I didn't mind that, but I did want a little bit more explanation and a little bit more depth in the world. And I think The Shade of Madness really did a good job with that. I felt like Chiego really settled into his writing and into the characters. We had already become established with all of them. So he was able to give a little bit more backstory and a little bit more history on each of them and why they were where they are and how they got there. And then I felt like in A Shade of Madness, Chiego was really able to tell us more about the magic system. And that started to expand in a really cool way. We got to learn more about the blood magic, a little bit more about the griffins, although I want to know more about the griffins, and more about this madness and how it was created, and how hopefully it is going to be stopped. So I think that the second book did a really good job of kind of bringing full circle some of the problems that I had with book, with book one, and I ended up giving it five stars. I loved it, and it was my first five star of the year. Next up, we have How to Sell a Haunted House, and this was the unofficially official Late Night Crew book club pick for the month of January. January. I wanted to love this. Grady Hendrix and I may just not be for one another because this book really did not work for me. It is following a woman and her brother that find out that a family member has passed away and they're going to kind of deal with the funeral and cleaning out the house of their parents and their parents have a bunch of like creepy dolls that her mom used to collect and they're having to try to figure out how to get everything cleaned out while also dealing with their grief or not dolls, they're puppets. Um, I lied, they're puppets. And the beginning of this story was a very heavily focused on the grief aspect to the point where it was really slow and intentionally making the main character kind of horrible. And I just found that the beginning's pacing was just way too slow and way too focused on the grief without really giving you that much depth. Then we kind of got to about the third of the book and things started to take a big change. That's where a lot of the plot and the horror aspects started coming into play. And then the last third of the book, it just went bonkers out in left field. Grady Hendrix just never made me believe any of it. I didn't believe the grief. I didn't believe a lot of the relationships. I didn't believe how a lot of this was happening and why it was happening. Motivations just didn't really make sense to me. And unfortunately, because of that, I was never immersed in the story. And by the time it got to the puppet stuff, which is something that really, really intrigued me, he had already lost me. So unfortunately, this one did also get a 4.17. This one was a two star. I hate that. I really, really wanted to love it, but it just did not work for me and my logic driven mind. Then we have the seventh book in the Expanse series, and that's Persopolis Rising. I'm not going to give you a description of this one in particular because it would spoil everything prior to this, but this is an epic space opera following James Holden and his crew and the troubles that they get into and this kind of intergalactic battle between the Belt, the Martians, and the Earthlings. It does kind of take a little bit of a first contact type spin, but not completely. And I think it does a really good job. This one is the first in the arc that's set 30 years after the first six books. And I really enjoyed it. We had a comeback of some of my favorite characters and favorite points of view to follow. I love Bobby. She's one of my favorites. And we got to see a lot of Bobby as well as James Holden and the crew in this book. And so I thought that it did a much better job of pacing than actually the first six books. The main problem that I had with the first six was that the points of view changed so much. So I was happy to see that we were following points of views that we had already been introduced to. And then I also feel like a lot of times these books take two to 300 pages, sometimes even halfway before the plot really kicks in, things start to get moving and start to come together. And they were a little too isolated in their own story for me. I wanted more of a cohesive arc behind all of them. This one did a really good job avoiding that. I felt like I was engaged from the beginning. Things were happening from the beginning. I wasn't waiting until the last 100 to 200 pages for things to actually kick in and happen. I don't know about the arc yet, but this did not feel like a self-contained story. It feels like part of a larger story. I think he did a really good job introducing me to that larger story. And so I'm really excited to finish out the last two books in the series. I ended up giving this one an 8.25, which is a pretty solid four star read. Then I went on a little bit of a binge and read the first, second, and third book in the War Eternal series by Rob J. Hayes. The first one is Along the Razor's Edge and I had a spectacularly fun time with this series. There is two more books in the series, but I think that they're a little bit of a time jump. So kind of like The Expanse where they're all still part of the same series, but the first three are kind of contained to themselves. Along the Razor's Edge follows Eska, who is 15 years old and has been captured by a the enemy. Her empire has been completely destroyed and she is down in this cave-like prison 
and it's been stuck there for many years. The majority of this book is set in the prison and we follow Eska as she's trying to navigate this and hopefully find a way out. She's in there with her best friend and one of the guys that she got to know when she was in the magic school to learn how to be, I don't know if he calls them mages, I can't remember. But the magic system in this is really, really cool. They can swallow certain, I think they're like metals or um, precious rocks, essentially. And each one gives you a different power. But if you're not already naturally attuned to that power, it kills you within seconds. Now, even if you are attuned to that power, it's still going to kill you at some point. You can just hang on to it a little bit longer than you can the others. And they have to, like forcefully throw these things back up to get them out of their system. And they can do things like necromancy and read minds, telepathy, go into the spirit world, all sorts of really cool stuff. Eska is one of the things about this book that you will either absolutely love or completely and totally hate. She is a very snarky, very just not super likable main character. She's very full of herself. She's very dramatic. Somebody said that they rem it reminded them of Nona Gray from Red Sister, and I can kind of see that. She's just a lot more dramatic and honestly a lot more full of herself. The other thing that bothered some people that I didn't particularly mind was that Eska is telling this story as an adult, talking to you about things that she experienced in her past. And sometimes she does give you a little bit too much information that some people would consider spoilers. Didn't bother my enjoyment because I wanted to know how she got to that point, so I didn't care if I already knew, but it, I can see where it would bother some people. The first book, really loved, ended up giving it a five star. The second book, the beginning was a little bit too slice of life for me, and it took a while for things to really get moving, but the second half, absolutely loved it. So I think I ended up giving Lessons Never Learned a four star just simply because the first half was not as strong. And then From Cold Ashes Risen was the third book. I thought it did a really good job of keeping that pacing, telling us how everything happened, explaining why Eska is kind of the way that she is and wrapping up all of those loose ends. Absolutely loved it. Gave that one a five star as well. Next we have one that I have actually just finished despite having started it at the beginning of February. And that is The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. This is a very, 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 very character driven story following Logan, Jezel, and Glockta primarily along with some other points of view. Logan is a old mercenary, I believe. He only has nine fingers and he's done some pretty crappy things in his life and he ends up meeting up with the first of the magi. Glockta is a inquisitor and basically a torturer who has been tortured himself and has a lot of like deformities. And then Jezel is a really spoiled prince or commander or something like that and he's very full of himself and kind of a bit of pretty boy. This book took me a while. It took me about a hundred pages for me to really feel like I had a good handle on everything and part of that I think was because I was trying to listen to the audiobook. Once I flipped to the physical I felt like I had a much better grasp of everything going on. Then it took probably until about halfway before I really started to connect to anyone at all. I was kind of thinking where the heck is all of the Joe Abercrombie like character love coming from because I don't get it. But slowly I did start to appreciate the characters more. I won't say that I ever did fall completely in love with them, but I ended up appreciating them. The number of times that Joe Abercrombie says the word piss in here in not a normal context just kind of got on my last nerve. I did feel like some of the dialogue was a little bit stilted and unnatural sounding, but I ended up being able to kind of ignore that. Otherwise it was well written and the plot doesn't really come in until the end we do start to get some more insight into the magic system and how all of this is going to start working, how the first of the Magi, what he is, stuff like that. But it wasn't until probably the last 150 pages that we get most of that. So I enjoyed it. I'm going to give it a three star, I think, with the intentions of continuing on in the series. Next up was my Patreon read for this month, and that is The Tethered Mage by Melissa Crusoe. This is a YA new adult type story that is set in a world where you have falcons who are able to control fire. And I think there may be some other different kinds of magic as well. But this doesn't really give you a ton of explanation into those other types of magic, like able to manipulate blood or skin or something like that. And then you have the falconers 
who are basically able to control the Falcons via a bracelet. And this bracelet is applied to them to try to keep them from having complete and total control so that they can't just burn down anything and everything. And there's a lot of like political stuff going on because some children have been stolen and there's going to be a war between two neighboring countries. This is following the princess, essentially, of one of the kingdoms, and she accidentally gets talked into becoming a falconer, even though she's not allowed to be. I had a very... I wanted to love my time with this story, but unfortunately, it did read a little bit younger to me. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do find that a lot of YA stories focus a lot more on the relationships and romance types of things and like friendships than they do on the world building and the magic system. So I kept wanting more complexity to this. I wanted to know more about the world. I wanted to know how the magic system worked. I wanted to know about all of these neighboring countries and I wanted to know what the other magic systems were like, but that was not really what the focus of this was. It was very heavily focused on the politics and unfortunately for me, that just meant a lot of standing around talking. I know a lot of people love politics and scheming and maneuvering, and I get it. But I'm not really one of those people. I prefer for things to be happening and for these political maneuvers to happen in events and things happening to the characters rather than all just talking about it, if that makes sense. I did not like the discussions and the way that these slavery type discussions were handled in this book. I know that Emma has said that that does improve upon and she does really start to go into that more in later books. But right now it just kind of feels like she said, well, if you can't control yourself, then somebody else needs to be able to do it for you, despite the fact that that completely strips your free will. Didn't love that. Again, I get it. Maybe that's a topic of discussion, but I do feel like it should have been a little bit more discussed in here because this is the first book. And if you don't love this, you're not going to continue. Anyway, this one ended up getting a very low three star. I can appreciate the way that it was written. I can appreciate what people thought about it and why someone would absolutely love it. It's just not the book for me, and I don't think I'll be continuing in the series. Oh, and then last but not least, we have The Lady of Rooksgrave Manor. This one I was reading for the Literature Book Club, and I think by the time you guys see this, the book club will have already happened, or at least it'll be happening within two hours of this being posted. So go check that out. It's over on Steph from Steph Love's channel. This is Monster Smut. And I'll be completely honest with you, I don't even really want to rate it because it is just very much so not the book for me. It's following Esther, who is a maid, and she is basically horny all the time and gets an offer to go work at this pleasure house with a bunch of monsters. I see the allure. It was well written. The smut is good, but there's way too much of it. It's 370 pages of straight smut. And I there were a lot of inconsistencies with like the characters and their the way that they said things and thought about things. The dialogue didn't work for me. The attempt at a plot was just not good. If you are somebody that likes smut and likes monster smut, please give this a try because I'm in the minority here. Most people I know gave it a four star. So that's really all I'm going to say about that. Go check out the live show if you want more of my thoughts as well as Cassidy's and Steph's because I think Cassidy was in a similar boat to me, but Steph really enjoyed it. So it'll be nice to hear from someone else why they liked it and get that differing point of view. Okay, everybody. So I think that covers all of the books that I wanted to talk to you about today. These are the books that were not included in vlogs for the month of January and February. Again, let me know down in the comments if you prefer this style or if you want me to go back to monthly wrap ups where I talk about all of the books that I have read in that month, including vlog books. So let me know what you want me to do. If you want to see the wrap ups, I'll still be glad to do them. I just don't want to do them if people are not as interested in them, but I still want to give love to the books that weren't in vlogs. So I think that covers everything. As always, just a quick reminder that I do have a Patreon. We do lots of fun stuff like reading sprints, watch alongs, readathons, all that stuff. And it's linked in the description box down below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, subscribe if you want it. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.